As the mailbox came into view, I pulled onto the shoulder. I put it in park and stared up at the driveway. An uneven set of ruts that disappeared into the dance of willows that struggled against the storm. Through the whipping vines, I could see the faint glow. A sign that someone was home, weathering the hell of the storm. I watched for a time, listening to the rain batter the windshield through the repetitive squeal of the wipers. My heart raced under the film of it all. The wind tearing through the trees, the bright flash of lightning, the heavy rumble in the sky, the house lurking in the darkness. On the passenger seat was the package, along with the manila envelope. I picked up the envelope and ran my thumbs over it. I had flipped through them a hundred times over the past two weeks, and still I found myself opening it. I didn't look long. The toothy smile, the soft face, the innocent eyes. Just seeing the photographs made me anxious. I set the envelope down and ran a hand over the box. Light brown cardboard sealed with packing tape. An address crudely written in Sharpie. It would make it through the storm if I moved fast enough. I killed the engine and watched the storm swallow the road ahead. I pocketed the keys and tucked the envelope under the cab's armrest. In the back seat was a gym bag, already open and filled with miscellaneous things. I turned on the dome light and reached back, my hand searching the contents until my fingers found what I was looking for. Digging through blindly, my eyes flicked between the oncoming road and the desolate driveway, to the faint glow in the distance. They were home. This was my chance. One by one, I withdrew the items from the bag, holding them up to the light to see. A beige ball cap. A reflective poncho. A clipboard with a newspaper cutout attached to it. Satisfied, I tucked the duffel bag behind the seat and moved on to the glove box. I popped it open and lifted the registration and collection of napkins to the two more important items underneath a 38 snub snub-nosed revolver, and a half-pint of whiskey. Both items glared back coldly, and I wondered for a moment if this time I could do without. Go big or go home. I ejected the cylinder and counted the rounds before tucking it into the back of my waistband. My gaze in the rearview mirror watched as I tilted the bottle to my lips. The burn was harsh but soothing. Two drinks. Almost half of it probably too much. I tossed the bottle back and slapped the glove box shut, the click of the dome light leaving me in a dull, surreal barrage of rain. I sat there for a moment, listening to the storm as I braced myself for what was to come. I gathered up the clipboard and package and threw open the door. The rain was coming down in sheets. The ball cap helped a little, but once the wind picked up, I had to hold it on so it would blow away. With one hand on the bill and the other ushering my items under the poncho, I crossed the street and ascended the slippery hill of a driveway. Puddles splashed and mud squelched, and as I made my way to the top, I squinted through the rain at the house in the distance. Parked sloppily in the gravel drive was a red sedan, one with a familiar license plate. I moved quickly, the warmth of the whiskey pushing me through the storm. I held the package close the events of recent days playing through my mind as I climbed the steps. Underneath the poncho, I felt the reminding weight of the revolver. By the time I stood in front of the door, I was thoroughly soaked. I took a deep breath, and thought of the words I had recited dozens of times. I raised my fist to the door. Three hard knocks. U.S. Postal Service, I shouted against the rain. Inside the house, someone cursed and stirred. Male. Gruff. What the hell? I heard the groan of a recliner, and the heavy footsteps moving towards the door. I took a second to peek through the windows, just long enough to get a feel. A television's glow on an empty couch. A pizza box left open. A little paper plate with two slices untouched the absence of light in the rooms beyond. 
On the other side of the door, several locks were disengaged. An upper latch. A deadbolt. The knob. The door pulled open just enough for a chain lock to snap taut, followed by an angry glare. What do you want? The glaring man had a shaved head, multiple face tattoos with sunken eyes. After he locked eyes with me, he looked past me to see if I was with anyone. U.S. Postal Service? I'm not expecting a package. Get lost. He went to slam the door, and I stopped it with my foot, clearing my throat. Sir, if you choose to refuse the package, I'll have to file it as a return to sender. I'll make note that this specific address chose not to sign for it. Is there a reason why you're refusing the package? What? He asked, annoyed. This is, uh... I paused, feigning a look at the clipboard. 1200 East, 500 South, right? He paused and looked me up and down before looking past me. Yeah, he said impatiently. Look, can you at least open the door and take a look at this thing to verify it's a mistake? I'm getting soaked out here, I urged, holding the box close. Just leave it on the doorstep and get out of here, he said. It has to be signed for, I reminded. If this is a bad time, I can try again tomorrow. I'll just make a note here and, and leave it to you. I raised the clipboard and he groaned. Fine, you can come in, but only for a second. Of course, I appreciate it. He shut the door hard and cut me off, and I could hear the rattle of the chain lock as he removed it. The door opened a second later, revealing a wiry man in jeans and a white tank top. He stood with his chest puffed out for a second, making me wait awkwardly before motioning to come inside. I shook the loose rainwater off me and ducked in, looking around the room as quickly and discreetly as I could. He pushed the door shut behind me. Thanks. Some weather, huh? It's freezing out there, I said, taking note of the surroundings. The television was on, an old program playing of a woman cheerily sewing dolls together. Ahead of it was the coffee table and the remnants of a piece of dinner that nobody ate. A little plate with no bites taken, and a big plate that looked like the food had just been pulled apart and played with. All blanketed in an aroma of rotting garbage. My guess was from the various overfilled bags near the island in the kitchen. I didn't see you pull in. Where's your truck? He asked blankly, scratching his head. He was built like a construction worker. His body covered in crude tattoos and scars. I thought of the whiskey, and wished I drank more of it. Oh? I'm surprised you didn't see me struggling out there. The truck couldn't make it up the drive. Too muddy. Believe it or not, the things are only rear-wheel drive. I chuckled, drumming my fingers on the box. My hands were clammy against the damp cardboard. Pizza guy made it just fine, he grumbled. I felt a chill on my neck. Right. I'm afraid we got a pretty big haul in the back, with Christmas coming up and all. I held out the clipboard to him. Well, if you wouldn't mind signing, I'll be on my way. He took it hesitantly. His eyes locked onto mine for a time before falling to the clipboard. I took a deep breath and tried not to straighten as I watched his expression change from aggravated to confused. His eyes narrowed, then widened. What? Just what the fuck is this supposed to be? He growled, showing me the clipboard. I didn't look at it. His other hand curled into a fist. I showed him the box, the scribbling in the corner with the black marker. This is the correct address. Is it not? I kept my cool. He was flustered, rapidly unwinding. Even still, he read the box, sensing the importance of it. His eyes went wild as he read it to himself, and I tried not to flinch against the incoming outburst. Who the fuck are you, huh? Who sent you? He spat, throwing the clipboard at me. If you can just verify that the address is correct, I can... Who are you? He was on me in an instant. Heavy hands grabbed fistfuls of the poncho and my clothes alike. He slammed me into the refrigerator so hard it rocked back and forth. The clipboard and package tumbled to the floor. U.S. Postal. Bullshit! What the fuck are you doing here? How'd you find me? His hands tore the fabric, nearly lifting me off the ground. He side-eyed the windows, to the rain battering the empty driveway. Nothing but the red sedan 
and a whole lot of mud. That wouldn't happen to be your 91 Sentra out there, would it? Anybody else home? I asked plainly, dropping the act. His face went slack. I'll kill you. I gripped my teeth and hoped for a punch. I got the island instead. The countertop slammed into my hip as I tried to resist, my shoes squeaking against the floor and I was tossed over it. I rolled to the other side in a hail of garbage and utensils, landing hard on my shoulder. As I tried to get to my feet, I heard him coming around, stomping through the debris as he seethed. It wasn't enough. It's only a matter of time. If not me, someone else. I said, just in time for him to rush me again. He was stronger but clumsy, thrashing out like a child in a tantrum. I saw the punch coming, his weight behind it. The most prominent knuckle crashed into my cheek and I felt the bloody swirl of the molar knocking loose. Through the scuffle, I heard it bounce off the tile. You made a mistake coming here. Should've just left me alone, he barked, shoving me into the counter. I tried to worm out of his grasp the hat falling and poncho tearing as he shoved me against the kitchen sink. I watched the room blur in the scuffle as the blows rained down. A punch in my gut, a knee in the side, an elbow in the ribs. His hands clamped around my throat and my back bent painfully into the sink, the overflow of dishes collapsing against me. Forks and spoons skittered away, and a glass shattered against the tile. His eyes were wild, his teeth bared. I forced my chin down to try to halt the asphyxiation, and he responded with a punch to the eye. Feeling my brow swell and welt under the impact of his knuckles, I felt an immediate clarity through the haze of violence. As he reared back for another punch, I grabbed him by the shoulders and drove my knee between his legs. God damn you, he groaned as he hunched over, his grip weakening. As I tried to shove him off and move away, he grabbed a fistful of hair and yanked me away from the sink, throwing me towards the living room. A stool bounced off my shin and I met the carpet face first next to the recliner. Behind me, the man groaned. I heard the angry toss of the counter's contents, followed by the metallic drag of a knife being pulled from the block. I'll gut you before you can take her away, he shouted, his feet kicking through the debris. I heard him kick one of the trash bags in frustration, the contents spilling out by my feet. Underneath the poncho, my hand gripped the revolver. I rolled over aimed the gun with both hands, and fired. Two shots, center mass. My ears rang as the bullets punched into him, and two dark spots overtook the stains in his dirty white tank top. The man stumbled back in surprise, falling into a heap against the island. The knife held close as he pawed at the wounds. He rambled incoherently, a string of starting sentences that faded quickly. The gun shook in my hands and my trigger finger itched to give him one more. With a final, hateful look, the man expired, his face freezing into a permanent mask of disdain. Even after his head drooped and his arms went limp, I kept the gun on him. My chest heaved, and my heart raced. I stood there for a time in the glow of the television, watching the body as my ears rang. The sweat on my forehead chilled and I felt the steady trickle of rainwater down my back. I nudged him with my foot. Nothing. I looked down the hall, to the darkness of the rest of the house. Nobody came running. No frantic spouse. No panicked children. No riled dog. Nothing. I deflated for a moment, wiping my brow and feeling the throb of where I'd been struck. As my nerves calmed, I looked at the room around me, seeing what I could make work. I wouldn't have much time. I dug into my pocket and pulled a pair of latex gloves, feeling anxious as the prophylactic drug across my skin. I went into the kitchen and navigated the debris from the scuffle. Paper plates, silverware, and broken glass had been strewn everywhere. Most of what had been collected on the island went on the floor when I went over it. I positioned each step gingerly, trying to keep my footing on the trash specifically as I located what I had lost. I found the ball cap on the floor near the stove. I picked it up and shook the glass from it before moving on. The clipboard and the package were on the floor where he had first charged me. 
I grabbed them both and set them on the island. Attached to the clipboard was a newspaper article. Still legible despite the damage the rain had done to it. I removed it and folded it up before pocketing it. Next, I moved on to the package. The box was soaked, the packing tape already starting to peel against the wet container. It opened easily. I took the item from within and placed it next to the clipboard, before crumpling the box as much as I could. With the clipboard and crumpled box in hand, I stepped over the dead man and moved to one of the trash bags near the island, to one that hadn't been knocked over. The bag had been barely tied, and came undone easily enough. It opened with a buzz of flies. I dug through the trash gently, pushing what I could to one side to create an alcove in the contents. Once I was satisfied, I took off the poncho. I wrapped the clipboard, ball cap, and crumpled box in a little wad, and stuffed it into the garbage as deep as I could get it, before covering it and retying it. After positioning it as it was before I touched it, I stepped back and observed the room. The kitchen was a disaster. The corpse was now bleeding from the mouth, a slow drool that blended into the blooms on his stomach. Behind me, the sewing program droned on, and the storm continued to rage outside, like nothing had ever happened. I grabbed the item from the package and started down the hall. The rest of the house was dark, and I flipped on the lights as I went. There were four doors in the hall, so I started with the closest. The first was a bathroom, and had nothing of interest. A small sink and a toilet, accompanied by a bathtub and shower. No paraphernalia. No signs of struggle or violence. I moved on, shutting the light off behind me. The second was a linen closet, one that hadn't been used for anything except junk storage. Dated boxes of as-seen-on-TV products, an ironing board, some hangers. Nothing of value. No hiding of dark secrets. The next room I assumed was the bedroom for the dead man in the kitchen. A single, yellowed mattress and box spring on the floor. One pillow, one blanket. An old dresser, a small closet. There were numerous sets of dumbbells and workout equipment on the floor. The garbage buildup was present in the room as well, but was mostly restricted to empty beer cans and takeout containers. I mined the trash and checked the dresser drawers. The ones that weren't empty contained only a stray pair of odd clothing, like a single sock or long johns. The closet held the most interest, but nothing really incriminating. Old flannels hung on wooden hangers, I used fish tank complete with a heating unit and bubble wand. A hunting rifle from the 90s leaning in the corner. Several old tins housing sewing utensils and thread. I closed the closet and ignored my rising heart rate. I dabbed my brow with my sleeve and left the bedroom, shutting off the light and closing the door behind me. Looking at the last door at the end of the hall, I felt a familiar, sickening churn in my stomach. The door was just as old and dated as the rest of the house, but there was one crucial detail that made me nauseous. An aftermarket padlock that kept it locked from the outside. I felt an encroaching darkness at the sight of it, an eerie validation of my presence. The padlock was cheap, but effective nonetheless, and the longer I looked at it, the more I tried not to panic. Across the face of the lock was the name of a generic brand, Secure Lock. I would need a key. I had already tossed the dresser and closet, as well as any other obvious location for such a thing. I didn't have to mull it over long, before I found myself looking in the direction of the island down the hall, to the dead man in the kitchen. Kneeling in front of his corpse was far from pleasant. The stillness of his body, the chill of his apparent departure, the slow drool from his lips. I dug into his pockets gently trying not to disturb his natural point of decomposition. His right-hand pocket was empty, save for some loose change. In his left, I found a string of keys. Among the rings were several keys, one to the front door, knob and deadbolt, one to the centra, a cheap toolbox key, and a small nickel-plated key. Looking over them all, I noticed the nickel-plated was decorated in the same secure lock logo. 
I pulled it from the ring and returned the others to his pocket before moving on. I left the dead man and moved to the door at the end of the hall. I inserted the key into the padlock and twisted, feeling a rush of anxiety as it popped open. The knob turned and I opened the door, revealing an old, dark wooden staircase and a stench of heavy, decrepit rot. I descended the stairs slowly, drawing the pistol in my off hand while the other clutched the item from the package. Each step was agonizing and deliberate, like I was walking into hell. The steps creaked and darkness swallowed me as I went in. But through the void I could see a sign of light. In the middle of the floor was a television, playing the same program from the living room. A cheery woman sewing the seams of dolls, the glow of the tube lighting the floor in front of it. Laying on the floor of the basement was a little girl. When I reached the landing, she stirred. Even in the desolate dark, I could recognize her. I took off the latex gloves and dug out my phone, and dialed three numbers with a shaking thumb. I listened to the dial tone in the dark, my eyes slowly adjusting to the rest of the basement, to the things lining the walls. When the operator picked up, the sound of my voice filled the room. This is Private Investigator Don Spencer. I'm at 1200 East, 500 North, just outside Dyer Falls. I need an ambulance immediately. There's been shots fired, and there's a child that needs immediate medical assistance. My car is on the shoulder near the driveway. We'll be waiting on the porch for you. Once the operator assured me help was on the way, I hung up. Hello? Someone there? The girl asked weakly, squinting through the dark. I moved toward the girl slowly, trying not to scare her. I held out the item from the package, close enough so she could see it. She looked at the little stuffed polar bear, its fur catching the light. Hi, Vanessa. My name's Donna. I'm a friend of your parents. They sent me here to find you. It's safe now. Would you mind coming with me so we can get out of here? Let's get you home. I held the bear out, hoping to keep her eyes on it. To keep her eyes off everything else in the basement. She looked at the bear and started to cry. I want to go home. I don't want to be here anymore. I gave her the bear, and while she held it, I cut the zip ties with a pocket knife. I instructed her to keep her eyes on it, and she nodded compliantly, nestling against me while I picked her up. I carried her up the stairs and out of the basement, away from the nightmare hidden in the shadows on the walls. By the time I had carried her down the hall, I could hear the sirens coming. I ushered her past the dead man in the kitchen and out onto the porch, away from the destruction of the house and the ungodly things within it. The storm had settled by then, a light drizzle pattering the mud by the time the first cruiser came into view. In the red and blue glow, I sat on the porch with her, and raised a hand passively as they got out of the car. After being missing for two weeks, the following morning, Vanessa Williams was reunited with her parents. As they rejoiced, I gave my statement. I explained I was a private investigator and had been hired by the Williams to find more information regarding their daughter's disappearance. While there wasn't much information at the time of Vanessa's abduction, I had taken upon myself to re-question everyone in the neighborhood specifically the residents living on the same block as the Williams. Most of the evidence gathered was either inconclusive or irrelevant to the crime. However, there were two residents claiming to have seen a specific red sedan driving around the area at the same time the abduction had taken place. I did some routine door-to-door questioning. Nothing too invasive. There had been a long list of missing persons in the town, so the locals were pretty forthcoming with information. Stopping by many houses outside city limits, mostly looking for a red car in the driveway, rumored abnormal behavior, stuff like that. When I couldn't find anything in town, I started pushing outside city limits, country line roads and the like. Stopped at a house on a long list on a road outside of town. The owner happened to have a 91 Nissan Sentra in the driveway. I knocked professionally and inquired about asking some questions, to which they obliged. The owner of the house let me in without any trouble. 
Everything was going well until I heard shouting coming from the basement. The owner got angry and started attacking me, unprovoked. Like a switch had been flipped. I tried to talk them down, but ended up having to pull my concealed carry firearm and shot them twice. Not happy I had to do it, but they forced my hand. I went into the basement and followed up on the screaming to see if there was someone in danger and found a girl tied up in the basement. I called for medical assistance immediately. They never found my newspaper clipping with the headline of Vanessa's disappearance. Or the cardboard box with Vanessa's address I had written on myself. Or the disguise I used. My means to get in. It all got shoveled away with the rest of the house trash. Never to be found again. Following my report, Dire Falls PD scoured the entire house. What first looked to be a simple child abduction case turned into an investigation of a house of horrors. The doll house, they would come to call it. It's unfortunate to say that Vanessa Williams was not just the victim of a spontaneous abduction, but a notch on a long list of disturbing acts tucked within the outskirts of Dire Falls. While on the surface the house just looked lazily unkempt and unorganized, the basement of the property would tell a different story. The basement in which Vanessa was kept also served as a burial ground for more than 20 other young girls. Jacob Ham, the now deceased owner of the property, had been tied to the killing of multiple young girls. A recent dig into Ham's files had shown that he had been admitted for psychiatric evaluation several times in the past. Four times since his mother's passing in adolescent years and two after his deployment in Afghanistan through the U.S. Army, since getting dishonorably discharged for things redacted in his time in the field. It is unclear as to what drove Ham to conduct such atrocities, but it is sure that the events will hang as a stain above Dire Falls' history as a town, and shake the people for years to come. Jacob was the last living member of the Ham family, since the passing of his mother, Amelia Ham a woman once known for her love of dolls and the timeless ideals they represent. Become a channel member today for early access, bonus videos, and special emojis only available to members. Check out the description below or click the join button for more info. If you'd like another way to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content, You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward, and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in a Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening, please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow, and see you again next time at 4pm Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.